Welcome back, Mr. Carter. Okay, and we are back on the air, and we're streaming and we're recording. Okay, so, uh, James, you were, or sorry, Daniel, you were saying uh, we were talking about crunchy bits and rules and freedom of players and GMs, etc. What, what were you going to say? I was going to make a comparison between the freeform role playing and uh, the exercises we do as actors to prepare for entering a scene. What happens is we have these, in my course, we have these body classes which have very esoteric exercises. For instance, in one such exercise, we held uh, a water balloon against our bodies in order to try and feel the consistency of our internal organs. Okay. And later, after we have this awareness, we try to move through the sensation. It sounds like crazy talk. No, but no, no, that's great. <laughs> that's great. And, and it can be crazy. I actually have a little bit of difficulty with these exercises because, you know, I like to think, oh, what's the objective here? <laughs> and, but that's not what you're supposed to do because you have to be in the moment. It's all right. meditative. Yeah, experience the moment. Be here now. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. and, uh, and that's why I'm so interested in not just in RPG therapeutics or RPG research, but in broadening the horizons into, you know, Relating it to drama therapy mm -hmm. and uh, to be able to feed this back into the game and feed what the game can offer into, you know, drama therapy because, well, but back to the point I was going to make that the, this exercise really works because it gives you very fluid, fluid movement during the scene, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. I do remember you speaking about very active exercises in uh, therapy. I think it was Autism Spectrum Children, the one where you had to rescue the, the royal family. Yes. I think. Yeah, the royal quest. Uh-huh. Yes. Uh, that, that's, how that, do you think this would relate to what I'm saying, uh, if at all? Oh, well, certainly. And because uh, we often mix, I mean, in addition to pure LARP and pure tabletop and pure computer-based, we often blur the boundaries between them by, by mixing in, uh, them together. Uh, and we even mix in music as well, because right? we do drum circles and such as part of the adventure uh, to summon people and to be part of the celebration and uh, things like that. We'll integrate uh, music, physical active music, into our LARP and tabletop sessions. Um, we, we experiment with AR and VR, and you know I'm hoping to integrate that more and more into our tabletop. As well. it's, it's obvious for LARP. It's not as so obvious for tabletop, but I hope to address, uh, there's a disability or a difference, I guess, if you will, uh, known as aphantasia, which is the inability to visualize something, you know, that's verbally described. So when they say, can you visualize this in your mind? Some people cannot do that. It is, it, there's a small percentage of the population. There's a lot of debate, but like even the term aphantasia is debated. But for these people who can't visualize, the argument is it's somewhere between 1% to 15% to a tenth of a percent. Nobody can nail down the number. But it is definitely... Uh, a thing. I've run into multiple people, gamers or otherwise, who if you verbally describe a scene to them, they cannot visualize it in their mind at all. If you show them a drawing, a representation, a photo, a VR snapshot, whatever, they can retain that image and, and now they can follow along. You say, yeah, you know that image I showed you, that map that I showed you? Now you're over on the left-hand side. Oh, okay, I get it. But if you just verbally narrate to them a scene, they cannot visualize it whole cloth. However, they can do it with other senses. If you tell them the smell of it, the feel of it, the you know the touch of it, the you know uh, temperature, humidity, um, uh, the noise of it, a lot of times they they can they can imagine those no problem. They just can't do the visual part of the imagining. Um, and what really solidified this for me because I'd read about it on and off, and I wasn't sure how many players had that issue, but I had a professor recently who that came up as a thing. He could not visualize. I was doing it. He wanted a quick example of what a role-playing game was like. And so I gave him a quick visual scene of you come into a room. It's a 20 by 20 room. There's this, this, and this, and this, this. And he's like, I can't, I can't follow that at all. I can't visualize that at all. And I went, ah, that's it. Aphantasia, that's it. <laughs> and so that's why it's so important to have uh, visual aids, like a whiteboard or a battle mat with miniatures. Um, I tend to dissuade people from using technologies like screens, projectors, etc. 
because what my research has shown, and I would love to do more research to figure out why, what the variances are, the moment you start adding a screen to a tabletop role-playing game, it takes people out of the game. It reduces the likelihood of deep immersion and or flow state. Um, and it can be as small as a smartphone and as large as a big projector screen. When we switch to looking at it that way as something that's on a screen projected or on a flat screen, whatever, something happens with our brains. And, you know, and I'm theorizing here, but I'm just noticing when I'm observing that people just aren't able, they, they switch out of imagination mode and instead switch to visual vi seeing mode. Instead of visualizing, they're seeing. And that is two different mm -hmm. things, right? You're using your, your occipital lobe to actually see. Right, you know, goes through your eyes and mm -hmm. back through, and, and and versus visualizing does light up your occipital lobe, but it it's a bypass to your actual eyes and such. What is the difference <clears throat> though between uh, Paul's large screen map right. and a dwar dwarven forge map? So Paul uh, Susak is a local therapist here, and he just got his PhD, right? That's what he told yes. us this year. So congratulations, Paul. Uh, he puts a flat screen on the table. He's made the flat screen the playing surface, the battle mat. And he uses a bunch of PowerPoint scenes, and it has animated fire and all these other things yeah. as they progress through the dungeon, which is really cool. It's it's a great idea. It's a lot of fun. I've done it with a projector overhead. The only problem with that is you got shadows and such. Yeah, but, that drives me nuts. Yeah, so, you know, <laughs> it, it, but it's a similar concept. And uh, it, it's very cool. And now I have not experimented with that exact setup. Right. But, so, so I don't know, but I think it's very different. If you have a miniature sitting on the battle mat, and I say, imagine the fire here, and I do a couple squiggles, and you go into imagining it in your head... Versus me showing. So it's telling versus showing. It's visualizing versus seeing. Right. And well, I'm theorizing here. I, don't I can know. literally I don't put pieces that represent the fire. Oh, you're talking about the 3D pieces? Yeah. Uh, I think it's because the 3D versus... The, I think when we look at a flat two-dimensional that has to be interpreted as 3D, but it's really just two-dimensional. Right. Our brains have to kick in. And again, I'm, I'm guessing at this point. Now, we're getting so far beyond <laughs> what research can tell me. At this point, eventually we can figure it out, but we need brain engineering. Um, I think it's because we are we're raised in a three dimensional world as babies. Right. We grasp and feel, and we associate with a three dimensional world. Photos, of screens, with the illusion of three D, but they're two dimensional. You know, and there's disabilities that have trouble with with flat screens, and you have animals that can't see right flatness. Right. It, does, right. it doesn't register for them uh, the same way as it does for us. It's, kind of, it's a different learning process, and, and it's something I don't know enough about visual processing to figure out. But what I have seen is the moment a screen is added to a tabletop role-playing game that otherwise was having really high immersion rates and potential flow states, um, you draw, you lose one to three points in a scale of zero to ten. You know, Zero being no immersion, no enjoyment. Ten being the ultimate experience of immersion and enjoyment. They've never had anything better. Um you can lose one to three points across the table with having any screen. It just it kept showing up for me. I wasn't even looking for it. I was not looking. I, I like technology. I'm a huge advocate for technology. I have an incredible, you know, very diverse technology background. And it kept showing up because I, I was controlling for different values. And I was getting these low ratings. I'm like, I did this, I did this, and I did this. Why did I still get low ratings on the, on the enjoyment? And then I started noticing, you know, people were futzing with their phones or they were using a tablet to look up the rules or they had their laptop to keep track of whatever their log notes were. I mean, I do, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I went, what if screen is going to do with it? So I started experimenting by not allowing screens. And, you know, and some people were resistant to that, but but for the most part, people were like, okay, sure, no problem. And the the same adventure and the similar scenarios, you know, accounting for all other variables that I could. And then it's difficult role playing gaming. It, there's so many confounds. There's so many variables. But testing it again and again, you know, with 120 plus players over a couple of years period, it kept showing up. With screens, I lost one to three points. Without screens, I gained them back. And I was able to repeat that and repeat that. It is. It was always statistically significant when there was any kind of screen. Um, depending on the screen, it was, you know, how disruptive it was. So I started having players, like, kind of the player, that's where I got the early idea of the player archetype specialist. 
be the annoying tapping on their phone doing whatever texting during the game. Mm-hmm. Or there was that one woman, did she remember the GM? She was here talking about she was playing a video game. Were you right. here for that? Playing a video game on her tablet while the game was going on. Right? And I was just like, oh my goodness, that is so rude. All I added, the, you know, I, 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 that predates that. But still, I had uh, that experiment, same thing. And so the more distracting it was, points plummeted for all participants, not just the person who was doing it. Because everybody else is aware when somebody else I is I can't remember who it was, but one person, such. they were telling me that they had to have the video game so that they could focus on the game. And it was a mindless game where all, they're doing just twists. Right, so it's like a, a fidget spinner. It's like, it was like them. a fidget yeah. spinner. And I was like, so why not just use but a you're, fidget spinner? Yeah, because you're reinforcing that too. Like yeah. you're reinforcing that behavior then when you do that. So anyway, uh, back to your original thing. I think it's great. Um, we, like with No Thank You Evil, uh, generally the kids by the end of the second session are pretty fidgety. So we've been experimenting with making it closer to a LARP with No Thank You Evil Adventures where we walk them around the room and as we're describing stuff visually, we place them in imaginary space and the kids are there. They can immediately, yes, that's a waterfall. Yes, that's a road. Yes, that's a ladder going up, right? They have no trouble using their imaginations that way. It's only the teenagers and adults that can be more resistant to that sometimes. You you help them work through that. And... Adding that physicality to it is for especially for little kids has you know works for them. It keeps them engaged because they get all fidgety and need to move. Um, so we want to do a lot more of that and experiment with that, where it's kind of a hybrid tabletop and LARP experience. And as I said, even a VR, AR thing, where to help address this visualization issue for aphantasia, that I say you enter into a room and it looks like this, and I have everybody don their goggles and look around the room that I've created a three-dimensional image of, whether it's using Google Paint, you know, 3D Paint right. or whatever, Tilt, Google Tilt or whatever. And they can see it, and they can look around and take a quick look and get it in their heads like, okay, and then they put the goggles aside. And now they recall it. Right. Now it's a combination. Now you're back to visualizing rather than seeing. <clears throat> it's something I've yet to experiment with. What's that? That's very interesting because in my course, we also have a class named uh, Interpretation, mm-hmm. where we do exactly details of uh, imagination exercises. The teacher says, oh, imagine yourself walking on a road, surrounded by flowers, and there's a cabin up in the woods, and you're going to that cabin, and there are weeds going everywhere, and you're going to plant weeds, and you're going to take care of the house, and you have to think about every single motion, how you react, how dusty it is, how grimy it is, how you clean things, how you plant things, <coughs> the feeling of everything. And you build these images in your mind. And as you do so, you also construct these images with your body. Yes. And it's not just, oh, uh, this, uh, this thing is the waterfall. You don't... Um, you don't have to think in the outside world as the thing. It's like, it's like the owl without the head, essentially. Uh, right. Yeah, no, it, it, it is very much. Um, so you know about Adam Johns and Adam Davis from Game to Grow Workshop, previously Wheelhouse Workshop, right? Yep. So Adam Davis is uh, one of the co-founders, and he has a uh, master's degree in education with a focus in drama therapy. So he, he, you know, he he definitely would be very, you know, he, the, you and he would definitely relate very much on that. I do have a theater background as well, um, and I did a lot of stage acting and a little bit of film. But um, <clears throat> and then, of course, I've been through Gestalt and other drama therapies and such over the years, and um, so they're they're all very powerful modalities and have a great. Uh, uh, they help a lot of people. They're, it's a wonderful modality. Um, the key thing is that the structure that a role-playing game adds, right? Because we've got the free-form aspect of role-playing, R-O-L-E playing, and we add R-O-L-L playing with the structured rules and the dice and whatever uh, to simulate, you know, randomness. Um, you know, adds an additional layer to that drama therapy type experience. Um, It also, because you create more defined characters that are more separate from yourself. So typically with these drama experiments, it's yourself and your imagining being something. 
But it's really your, you know, because as an actor and stuff, you're trying to be the character. With the tabletop role playing experience more than LARP and such, there is a, you are playing your character, but there is a little bit more of a separation. Now, some people, there's less separation than others, but there really is a, a, a more of a separation because you have a character sheet with stats and information, and it is more other than yourself, right. which creates a little bit more of a safer buffer to experiment with things that it's the character doing this, not me. That when you do with LARP or drama therapy, might be a lot scarier. And bleed, are you familiar with the term bleed in the context of role-playing gaming? Yeah. So uh, Dr. Serlin Bowman, Professor Serlin Bowman, has some wonderful videos on this and, and goes in length about it. She's, she's uh, quite a, a, at the forefront of the studies on bleed. And she's big on LARP. She goes LARPs all over the world all the time. She's based out of Texas. And we've talked about it before in other shows. Yeah. So bleed is kind of where the real world bleeds in your character or where your character game experiences bleed into your real world. So if you had a lousy day at work and you come to the game and your character is being grouchy, even though your character is not normally grouchy, and your character is making decisions based on you having a lousy day, you've bled from the real world into the game, and you've kind of screwed up the game. You know, you've let the real world alter the game, uh, as opposed to playing in the situation of the game rather than, you know. The other one is, let's say you play a game, and I'm mean, going to use negatives here just because it's not always a negative. There's, there's positive aspects to bleed, but we're going to use the negatives right now. Uh, you're, you have a really lousy game session. Your character, you know, fails at every role and gets beaten up and it just goes lousy. And so you go on home and, you know, kick the cat, you know, whatever. <laughs> You've now bled from the game into the real world, the emotions, the experiences that you had. Um, and you want to be careful about that. Uh, you want to be careful that, that you don't, like if I say something in character to another character, um, you know, you really suck, right? And if I do it, in character, like, well, the way to go, Idaho, you really suck. At least if I'm using my character voice instead of my own voice, the other person receives it more as the other character saying that to their character. Versus if I say, you know, use your name, like, Riley, you literally suck the way you did that, right? Now it's become personal. It's a personal attack rather than right. characters interacting with each other. So, um <laughs> Now it doesn't. It's it's not foolproof. It's not perfect at all. I, I uh, a year or two ago I had a player. I was playing uh, a jerk of a military officer or something. I forget exactly what it was, and he was just lambasting one of the other player characters. And it was in voice. I was like, "Hey, if you do this again in this town, I'm gonna tear you up a new one." Whatever you know, it was just chewing about. And she's like. Why are you so mean to me? And I'm like, whoa, 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 this is not you. I mean, this is not me. This is character. Stay character. You know, and I had to, I had to walk her through that process. But she's just like, you just, I could see you as that you were just, you were that, you were that sar soldier, and I just, it felt like you were. And the soldier was angry at me, and it just, it was too real for her. We had to back it off a little bit and go, okay. Um, no, thank you, evil card. Yeah, <laughs> X card. Yeah. No, the yield card. Yeah, exactly. So, so bleed, you know, can be a dangerous thing uh, if it happens in a negative. Now, it can also be a positive. For example, you want some of the skills that are learned and some of the positive reinforcers that happen. You know, if they have a good day and it helps brighten their week because they had a good game, that's a good bleed. You want some of that. Yeah. You know, that's that's a nice thing to have. Um, or it, learn a new skill. Uh, another type of bleed is like the personality bleed, like you, your character bleeds through. Like uh, you know, this happens with actors, like method actors and such. They stay in character all the time, right? It's the ultimate of bleed between. There's no boundary between their character and the real world until the movie's over, right? I don't know if you've worked with many method actors, but it can be really annoying. <laughs> mm. <clears throat> um, I understand. Um, for instance, I, I, I recently started playing uh, Star Wars D6, and I must confess that I, I can't imagine playing a character who doesn't consider droids to be people. <laughs> I just <laughs> find the whole droid mind wife thing a bit disturbing. <laughs> Right, and we have Star Wars D6 here. I mean, I played that back in the 80s, and we have the newer Star Wars from Final from uh, uh, Fantasy, Fantasy Flight, Flight games, games as well. Um, I, I, I do I do remember fondly the D6 version. I like the old D6 version. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so we have, we have a, a lot of information about Bleed. Um, with the drama therapy and such, yeah, you were talking about the... Um, 
the royal family, uh, 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 save the royal family with the LARP there, um, and, and creating real world obstacles and, and the physicality of it, it all have value and they all have different pros and cons. Uh, there's pros and cons in implementation because, you know, a tabletop game, I don't need a lot of physical space. And I don't need a whole bunch of physical props. We can do a tabletop game with just paper, pencil, dice, and call that good. If we can add more if we want. We can add a battle mat and miniatures or a whiteboard. We can add these other things. But you don't need a lot. You need your rule books, whatever those rules happen to be. Right. Um, you start to get into the physical world. You can use imagination, and that works great. If you're going to get up and move around, you need space to move around. So instead of being in a little office space or a little meeting room, now you've got to have a larger space to move around, so you have to take that into context. If somebody falls down while you're moving around, do you have your liability coverage, right? It's a little different <laughs> if everybody's sitting, but if you have people moving around and pretending things and fall down, you got you know, sort of liability things to be aware of. Um, there are people with physical disabilities that won't be able to relate. So if you tell everybody to, you know, go up the stairs and such, that could be a problem for some people. Um, so you have to, you always have to be very specific about the client base that you're working with uh, to take into account each of these modalities. And as I said, we blend them all the time. Like the MDA camp and other things like that, we did all of them. We were doing music, we were doing live action, we were doing tabletop. You know, the only thing we weren't doing was computer stuff, but we we do computer stuff as well. Uh, Neverwinter Nights, you know, Neverwinter Nights just reissued their, the, they redid Neverwinter Nights. It's a new improved it's never were nights, but they've recompiled it to be right. more modern. Um, and that game just keeps going. And, you know, we love Nowhere Nights because we can create our own modules for it. And imagine what we could do if we could get that into VR. Oh, that's yeah, be awesome. I'm really looking forward to that, too. Um, so these all have possibilities. I'm excited about all of them. Uh, I'm, I, but I'm going to rein it in here and get us back to reading because we're running out of time. Um, but those are wonderful comments, Daniel, and please keep them coming. <clears throat> Uh, but we will we will move on here because <laughs> we haven't actually really we were still reviewing we never read really. anything. Uh, so we were going to do game systems continuums of crunchiness. So we had accessibility. We talked about what's accessible to people. Power balance is what we were talked about last. Was choice of system affects your degree of control over events in the game. So he says the more a game depends on crunchy bits, the more power it cedes to the players at at the expense of the GM. So in that way, the GM doesn't get to make rulings about what the rules are. It's right. there. It's written out. Um, on the other hand, it also makes things more predictable for the GM and give, frees up the GM to be able to work on all these other story things and such that could be done, too. So, I, I it, you know, it, it, yeah. I understand his point, but I also want to make people think about the other points. So uh, rule number five was rules in which crunchy bits predominate give power to the players. And then I said but also reduce freedom of the uh, PC because the more defined the rules are, they're locked into those rules as opposed to fewer rules. Can my PC do this? The GM goes, yeah, you bet. Why not? Because it's not predefined. If it's predefined, unless you're going off the book, that PC loses that freedom. So that's where it's a, you know there's a give and take on that. Um, <clears throat> Rule systems that limit the impact of crunchy bits give power to the GM, but it said, and potentially, this is what I'm adding, and potentially uh, more freedom for the PCs too, because now they're, they don't have really limiting rules. They can try, they're, they're, they're going to be less constrained by the rules and try things, and the GM will get to decide whether that's a yay or nay, depending on the game system. Uh, Tor, there's a lot of rules in there that say, as long as everybody in the party agrees, including the GM, but uh, right. the party agrees, they can go ahead and do it. There's no role. They have they have a special feature that they can automatically do it, and they have to describe it the correct way. And if everybody goes, yeah, that sounds in character, then it, it happens. And each 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 character is that way. So that's in the One Ring role playing game. Uh, there's no role. It's it's an automatic thing, but they have to describe it in a way that everybody agrees it works. And that's on the players. Uh, the One Ring role playing game lets the players have a lot more control about the results than the GM typically does. Which is which is. This reminds me of a, a system I heard about when I was in England called Lady Blackbird. Have you heard of it? I have heard of it. I've never played it. I haven't. Heard I of have it. heard of it from talking to other people. Go ahead and talk about that if you recall it. I haven't actually tried it. But okay. It's a game where instead of the GM describing the situation, 
the GM acts as a bit of a creative prompter and asks the players, oh, how do you go across try doing what you want to do here? Oh, if any complication arises, what could it be? But there's, what if there's someone on the other side of the door you're trying to sneak through? What going to happen? The game ends up being less of a game and more of a, a creative, a collective creative prompt exchange in a way, which is really the most thing I, I've ever seen. So there is a Wired article about Lady Blackbird from 2011. And it's an in-depth RPG review. Lady Blackbird is simply awesome. <clears throat> and uh, they talk about they have a limited amount of time to spend, you know, doing role-playing gaming with busy schedules, etc. as an adult. Uh, so they're constantly in search for low prep, short duration, one to three sessions, simple to learn RPGs to try out. Luckily, there's a lot of choices. So uh, in this one, we tried out Lady Blackbird. It's an award-winning free RPG written and illustrated by John Harper. Uh, the 15-page PDF is an all-in-one game which consists of the rules, setting, characters, and situation for a complete gaming experience, typically lasting for one to two sessions. The scenario is set in very evocative steampunk slash sci-fi slash fantasy setting that is clearly influenced by the likes of Firefly and Star Wars Episode IV without being too derivative. The setup for the game is probably best explained by quoting the text of the game itself uh, uses. Lady Blackbird is on the run from an arranged marriage to Count Carlo. She hired a smuggler skyship, the Owl, to take her from her palace on the imperial world of Elysium to the far reaches of the remnants so she could be with her, secret, her once secret lover, the pirate king, Uria Flint. However, just before reaching the halfway point of Haven, the owl was pursued and captured by the imperial cruiser Hand of Sorrow under charges of flying a false flag. Even now, Lady Blackbird, her bodyguard, and the crew of the owl are detained in the brig, while the commander of the cruiser, Captain Hollis, runs the smuggler ship's registry over the wireless. It's only a matter of time before they discover the outstanding warrants and learn that the owl is owned by none other than the infamous outcast, Cyrus Vance. How will Lady Blackbird and the others escape the Hand of Sorrow? What dangers lie in their path? Will they be able to find the secret lair of the Pirate King? If they do, will Uria Flint accept Lady Blackbird as his bride? By the time they get there, will she want him too? So, um... It's packed with everything you need to the game. Page one is the setup of the game and credits. Page two, an overview of the entire Lady Blackbird universe, including a color map of the wild blue. It's set up in a gaze of tier format. Pages three, three through seven of the character sheets. There's five characters. Page eight is the owl, the skyship. Page nine is how to run the game. One page of GM tips, tricks, and advice. It covers everything a new GM needs to run a successful session. Page 10, character advancement info. Uh, pages 11 through 15, summaries of the PCs for the GM. Uh, the mecha mechanics. So anyway, this is something we should definitely check out. Yeah. We should definitely check that out. And the price is right. Uses a dice pool system, which character starts with a single die and then adds additional dice depending on what traits and tags they have, etc. So, yeah, that sounds interesting. It definitely sounds like a more open-ended free for a game, and there's quite a few of those. That's The last 10, 15 years, that's been the trend, is more free-form, lighter rules systems. And for some of the reasons he stated, people have you know are busy and don't want to spend a bunch of time going deep in the rules, and uh, you know it's various reasons. And there's a whole spectra there. Um, and yeah, that does look like a that ship that on the artwork does look a bit like the Firefly. Yeah, <laughs> Serenity a looks a bit like Serenity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's one possibility. Yeah, that's a possibility. Um, uh, I think it's 
what, what he mentioned about time and stuff is one factor. Uh, I think what you're saying is another factor to consider. Uh, but I do run into players who really do prefer a more detailed system as well. And they're very frustrated by the lack of, you know, like w- with D&D going lighter instead of heavier, a lot right. of people have reverted back to 3.5 or even Pathfinder, um, which I still find even, you know, those to be pretty rules light compared to Rollmaster. <laughs> Everything's rules light compared to Rollmaster. No, Master. I think hero. I think the hero system was supposed to be even more complex than Rollmaster, supposedly. No. Oh. But I've yet to fully get to play that. It's been a long time. I think I got to play it back in the 80s, but I don't remember it well enough. Um, there were rules light systems. Well, let me let me... There's a misconception that D&D was originally a rules-heavy system, and it wasn't. So first of all, Chainmail, of course, is wargaming. But the original D&D only used a D6 and a D20, no other dice. It had very few rules. It was three little booklets initially, and then they slowly added some others. And the, the, the math and the system was extremely simple. It was very rules-light. And you could do anything you wanted with it. Now, they, coming from... The chainmail um, uh, you know, wargaming background, they chose to do dungeon crawls and things like that. But that was a player style that had nothing to do with the rule system limiting them to that. But the original Dungeons and Dragons was very rules light. So every time I hear people talk about, uh, well, we need to go low rules light because D and D is too heavy. I'm like, well, then go back to original D and D. And we did when they republished the original D and D box set the original ODD, which which we did i was running that uh, late nights at a local game store um and really enjoying the freedom of a very light rule system there was not a whole lot defined it it was badly organized that was one of the reasons yeah. why they republished later in ad and d and in beck me well that's yeah that's beck me but that's why they came out with ad and d and then somebody wanted a lighter version so they did basic D. Um, and those were more organized because because OD and D had been growing organically, and they'd add another supplement and another supplement, and now you had to jump between the supplements to find the rules, and it was all over the place. Uh, so that was just an organizational issue. But if you play, the, if you ever play the original Dungeons and Dragons, you will see a truly very rules light system. Um, so that's just something to be aware of. It became over time more complicated because it's what people wanted. Instead of everybody house ruling everything. They wanted the rules to be defined in the game. Now, this will totally depend on your player types. So, as you've missed from our earlier sessions, we've talked about player types. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown of them. <laughs> We're running out of time here. Uh, we have the power gamer. So, these are player archetypes, basically, and he talks about uh, a hand, half dozen of them. The power gamer, the butt kicker, the tactician, the specialist, the method actor, the storyteller, and the casual gamer. Um, So Rules Light appeals more towards the storyteller, the method actor, and the casual gamer. More complex rules are generally more appealing to the power gamer, the butt kicker, kicker, the tactician, and maybe the specialist. Specialist could could come or go on that. So we discussed that quite a bit about rules complexity and player type in our previous, in in last Thursday's uh, video, if you want to check that out. But he has here on the continuum... Um, anyway, I, I, your theory, I think, is, is, is totally worth accounting for. Uh, also, what, what uh, the uh, article said about time and availability uh, is certainly another factor to take into account. Um, I think there's a, a little bit of laziness also. I mean, not just time, but even people who do have plenty of time. Right. Uh, they don't want the effort. Uh, I can't believe how math-averse, every, at least here in the States, I don't know how it is in Brazil, but... People here are so math averse that even if it if it's like even just simple addition and subtraction, they're groaning. Oh no, math! Like it's addition and subtraction of single numbers. Come on, math is hard. <laughs> and here in the U.S., there's a real stigma because of a really bad educational system in math. That's the biggest problem with our country with math is a really bad approach. Everybody has a negative attitude about math. And then they wonder why there's so few engineers, et cetera. Um, what I have found, though, is people who were daunted by math were able to play role master just as well as those who were math crunchers. Uh, what you had to do was do it incrementally and slowly and carefully, not all at once. Any complex topic can be learned if you slowly layer it up and layer it up and layer it up. Um, the problem is when people just you know throw them into the fire and they don't have preparation for it. 
Uh, so, and there has been, in addition to the simplifying of games, even for the more complex games, there's been a dumbing down of all of them that I, this is one of my pet peeves. You've triggered one of my pet peeves, one of several, <laughs> which is the dumbing down of the language and the mechanics because they believe that everybody is too stupid to be able to handle a higher level of language and game system and math. And that is not my observation of people. Um, if you set a higher bar and you do it in a gradual progression, you raise people up. If you set a lower bar, you don't raise people up as much. And the people who are already above that bar, you drag them down or lose them because they're not being challenged. Mm -hmm. So again, you have to be aware of those who are not close to the bar. Uh, we've covered a lot of this in our therapeutic recreation uh, area. We have a whole thing about challenge by choice. We talk about Mihai Csikszentmihalyi and flow state and having enough challenge without being completely overwhelming, you know, to get them to where they enjoy it. So you have to have a lot, there's a lot of variables there. But dumbing down the role-playing games is the exact wrong approach. Breaking down role-playing games into incremental learning, that's the right way to do it. So we, we just did it last week where we went over, went through the basic role-playing game uh, from 1983 by Frank Metzer of D&D of how they layered in complexity and started you with a very simple concept and then added a little more, a little more, a little more. That's how we learn. And you can make it as complex as you want then, and it won't bother people. People will enjoy the game if you're doing it right. You don't have to dumb down the language, you know, immensely. Um, you don't have to dumb down the mechanics immensely. You just have to break it down into pieces and don't just throw it at them all at once. And if you do it that way, mm -hmm. If you do it that way, you raise people up. And that's what a part of the power of role-playing games of the past is that you raised people up. You watched people. I, I've had so many people where math used to kick their rears, and it was because of gaming. It, at least the basic math became a piece of cake for them because yep. they were doing it all day long during their game sessions. And a few months before, mm -hmm. they, they just were terrified of it, and now it was no big deal. And the more advanced math with Role Master and such because you get, you get a little fancier there. Um, that there, you know, there were multiple studies about participating in role-playing games raises up your linguistic ability. Well, those studies are going to have to be redone because these newer games are dumbed down to third grade level, a lot of them. And so that's not going to raise up your linguistic abilities if you're at fifth level, at fifth grade. Uh, but if you're, if you're using a mixture of language that's accessible, but they also occasionally might have to look something up, oh my, not that, might have to learn something. <laughs> So there's a little bit of fear and there's a little bit of laziness. Uh, and this is, as I said, one of my big pet peeves about the modern role-playing games is there's kind of a, uh, no, everybody's too stupid, so we got to dumb it down. And I com couldn't disagree more. Uh, I personally attack him, Mr. What's that? I personally attack Mr. Hulk. Oh, no! <laughs> no, 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 no. So many things in Pathfinder before I changed the system. Why do you torture me so Never mind, it's just joking. Oh, <laughs> okay. I'm like, no, no, I'm not. I'm talking about the game developers, not the not the players. <laughs> so, uh, but you understand why, you know, because I've, I've watched role-playing games over decades. I mean, since 1983, I started researching 1985, using them in educational settings. And I've watched them just transform people of all ages and raise them up. And now I don't see as dramatic effect with these newer games. Um, they help. They're, they have a lot of other benefits. Role-playing games have lots of benefits anyway. But the linguistic and mathematical and the, some of the more complicated areas of it, that's not being raised up the same way. And I think, I think that we do a disservice to people when we don't. When, when we avoid those things that are hard for people and not try to help them achieve its success. I think in some ways uh, GMs can overcome that if they're intentionally setting out to do that. Yes. You have to yeah. think you have to have awareness. I'm going to use larger words. I'm going to Intentionality, use... yes. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, all right. We're, we're still summarizing our last session. <laughs> <laughs> 20 minutes. And we have 20 minutes left. Oh, boy. Uh, so Next it week. talks about while well, game masters may naturally prefer games which give us the greatest flexibility, we have to remember that players like to have power too. One of the many factors behind Dungeons & Dragons is during popularity is the way in which its power balance favors the players. 
Uh, there's no one ideal power balance between players and GM. The best balance varies according to the composition of your group because the need for player power depends on play style. So power gamers naturally are the ultimate beneficiaries of any game in which the crunchy bits go wild. The discomfiture of the GM is the supreme expression of their power. Uh, this is, again, his assumption is game masters are all uh, control freaks. And again, I disagree with that premise. As I think that's a minority of game masters, not a majority. Uh, the discomfiture of the GM is the supreme expression of their power. The harder, shinier, buffer, and more defined a rules system's crunchy bits, the more they'll like it. And then I have a note that says, but... My handwriting's so terrible sometimes. <laughs> really work on that. Uh, it's it's dysgraphia, man. It's, yeah, it's a problem. <laughs> uh, but also more constrained by it. They're, the more crunchy bits there are, the more they're all, they're also more constrained by those rules too. Tacticians thrive in systems that take power from the GM. They benefit most strongly from rule systems in which the game effects of various powers are tightly defined. They want to surprise the GM and easily overcome his obstacles. To a tactician, anticlimax is a good thing. I, I disagree with that. He keeps saying that over and over, and I don't agree with that at all. Uh, a session in which the group risklessly circumvents every barrier placed in its path is the tactician's ultimate dream. And I, no, I disagree. Too. Yeah, I, he's got some interesting concepts. This article, this uh, is from 2002, by the way, of uh, Steve Jackson Games. Uh, to the degree that method actors care about rules at all, which they don't much, they favor systems that empower <coughs> players. <coughs> In their quest to remain true to their character concepts, they sometimes put themselves at odds with other PCs or stand in the way of plot developments necessary to the smooth unfolding of the GM's adventure. To maintain their autonomy, they often gravitate towards crunchy bits that protect their lone wolf behavior patterns. They want to be able to turn invisible and leave situations they don't like or to fly away. They need to be able to resist mind control attempts and other similar coercions. Method actors may also choose crunchy bits that render them indispensable to the group. This tactic increases their negotiating power during disputes between players. Implicit in their every argument is the threat to not participate in a plan they don't like. The group, knowing they'll be deprived of a vital array of abilities, is forced to accommodate the method actor even when they're a minority of one. Butt kickers want to wade into combat early and often. They like crunchy bits that make their PCs mightier in battle, but don't want other PCs to use other abilities to avoid fights. So long as the opportunities for smiting are frequent and colorful, they tend to be indifferent to the power balance between players and GM. Specialists want the defining abilities of their chosen character types to be effective. So specialists would be somebody who, like, flies, or somebody who... Ninja. Can, yeah, ninja. They're very specialized. Uh, systems that define their signature country bits broadly or imprecisely may suit them well, because they allow the GM to add interesting variations to the scenes they look forward uh, to repeating over and over again. They don't want an obstacle to end anticlimatically if it means being deprived of the, balance, the chance to strut their stuff. Storytellers, happiest when a game session unfolds like fiction or a TV episode, thrive when the GM enjoys the flexibility needed to control pacing. The anticlimax beloved by the tactician is anathema to the storyteller. Storytellers tend to favor rule sets that either present crunchy bits in vague terms or allow them to define their abilities on the fly. They enjoy personalizing and redefining their powers in creative and funky ways. Casual gamers don't care much about the power balance, one way or the other, but are turned off by the wrangling and argument that tends to erupt when the balance is off. So any arguing and wrangling that goes on is going to turn off a game for most people, except for rules lawyers and people who like arguing. Right. You want to kill a game very quickly, sit and argue about the rules or where somebody was placed, etc. You know, sometimes you have to make a quick correction. You do not want to turn it into an argument. The right choice of rule set for the rest of your group will also be the right one for your casual gamer. So he's got a little diagram on page 10 for a graphic representation of the play styles and rule sets they gravitate towards. So it's on a spectrum. Nobody's going to really be able to see this, but you've got a spectrum from one end to the other. And I know you really can't see it. <laughs> it's but, not exactly uh, Bartlett's. Yeah, <laughs> Bartles. Bartles. Bartles, taxonomy of player type, yeah. Yeah, it's just a two-dimension, or single dimension. yeah, anyway. Uh, so rules favor the GM. He's got storyteller and then going towards the center, specialist, butt kicker, method actor. And then rules favor players. That's continuing over tactician and then power gamer. So again, this is his theory. And we love to discuss everybody's theories. And then we debate and discuss where we agree and disagree, etc. And, you know, like the whole casual gamer, we didn't even think about as an archetype until we started reading this article. We're like, oh, yeah, casual gamer. 
casual gamer is not going to be, they want to put too much effort into it. They're a casual gamer. They're there for the social experience and the game experience, but it's all, they're not going to put in a ton of effort, and we hadn't really taken that into account. Would, would you feel that a casual gamer would prefer a um, country bit heavier game just because um, they feel less pressured to have to come up with what they, I mean. It would I depend guess. on the person there. Yeah. So if the person doesn't like coming, having to be creative and likes to just follow the rules, then yes. But if they're a person who doesn't want to have to learn the rules, which is what we're talking mm -hmm. about. They don't want to have to wade through a rule book. They're kind of like, well, what should I do? Just tell me what I can do and can't do. They don't really want to. They're not going to crack open the rule book. Mm -hmm. So casual gamer is I not. Have, what's that? I have just one concern with this single dimension is that I sort of think that it's a bit of a crunch in the rules. And if there's evocativeness of systems. Sure. And again, I, I agree. This single dimension uh, spectrum is flawed in many ways. I totally agree. Well, that's why we were mentioning Bartle's Taxonomy of Players, which is multidimensional, and there's even others uh, that take into account more of these variables. So, yeah, we, we're, we're in agreement with you that this, is, this definitely has its flaws, but it brings up some interesting things to start thinking about. Um, have, you, have you checked out Bartle's Taxonomy of Player Type yet? That's okay. When when you get once we get your account set up, when you go through all the baseline training, you'll be watching my lecture videos if you haven't already. You already did see the Seattle one, right? The Children's Hospital Seattle, Seattle Children's Hospital video. I can't remember. Okay, that's fine. You'll you'll go through a whole checklist of videos and reading, and you'll be brought up to speed on a lot of these terms. So we'll we'll get you there. This will be an iterative thing. Like you never, we never expect you to retain everything. Um, now, on our theory days, when my when the RPG education website's working, we do actually do a quiz, but we're still fixing that server, so there's no quiz today. I might do you know some verbal things on things, but since we're short on time, we'll probably skip that today. Um, mm -hmm. But we do usually on the theory days do a, a little bit of a quiz on topics. On the applied days, we don't. We uh, on applied days we give feedback at the end of the session to either the game master who's training, or if we're evaluating a new game, we all give our reviews about what we think of the game and how it applies to our goals as, as an organization. So we, we always have something. So we either have a quiz at the end on theory days, or we have uh, a, evaluations of a game master or of a game on applied days at the end of the sessions. <clears throat> Let's see. So, so then he does a whole to determine the desired crunchiness levels for your group. Assign a score for each player in your group according to their play style. For players with odd combinations of preferences, you may choose to award half points or perform other arcane adjustments. And so he just says like plus three for power gamer, plus two technician, plus two method actor, zero for casual gamer, zero for butt kicker, minus one for specialist, minus three for storyteller. Then average the results. Final score near three means that your group would probably prefer a system heavy on the crunchy bits like Dungeons and Dragons, or one in which the rules are tightly defined such as GURPS. A score near negative three suggests that you should check out games which crunchy bits are loosely defined, like Vampire the Masquerade, or uh, the the Cortex system in Firefly RPG, or Amber Diceless. Right. <laughs> uh, result near zero suggests that you should just go ahead and pick whatever the heck you want, probably with a mix. Uh, this is not to say you should utterly ignore your own tastes. You won't get far trying to use a rule set written for a style you can't stand. But a big despair... Now, I'll, I'll disagree with that a little bit. It depends how much ego you have in it. I am able to completely set aside my preferences if we're all having a good time in the game. But is he also talking about it doesn't matter if the role set if you hate the genre? Well, that's a whole other topic. He's just talking about the crunchiness of yeah. the the crunchiness of the game. What is your preference? As far as crunchiness? Yeah. My personal pre preferences, I like complex, detailed rule systems that also emphasize trying to come up with role-playing options rather than combat or spell options. So the more tightly defined and well spelled out the rules are, and a deadly system, one that has the consequences are deadly, which is why I like Role Master. The crit charts in there are brutal. And if you're going to get into a fight with somebody, whether it's magic or uh, physical combat or whatever, 
you better be prepared to lose bits of yourself as you know let you better be you better make sure you have the advantage if you're going to go have a fight you better make sure the fight's over quickly and that you have the advantage or you're going to get maimed um so you might want to look at other options to fighting you might want to look at other options to blowing things up that's so that a lot of people accuse highly technical systems because what happens is the game masters often that like the highly technical systems don't like role play role play and i'm a weird fluke that way right i'm, yeah. I'm weird that i prefer role play but i like a highly technical system that is not a usual combo most people like the highly technical systems might be on the autism spectrum or might just be a heavy rules lawyer or whatever and don't like all of this storyteller, method actor, you know, free form stuff. And I love that too. And so what happens in my case is that when I GM with a heavy system like Rollmaster with my writer group and such, um, because I'm encouraging role play all the time, the crunchiness is there to use however they want to do. And they, they, I have campaigns, you know, span years, so they get very powerful over time. And Rollmaster goes to 50th level, by the way. It's defined all the way to 50th level. And level progression is very slow compared to D&D. So it takes you a lot longer to get to 10th level Rollmaster than it does to get to 10th level D&D. So imagine going to 50th level. Um, yet they're fairly comparably powerful. So a 50th level Rollmaster is, you know... Um, but because of the deadliness of the game they learn very quickly, oh, we better not just charge into combat all the time. We better really think this out, tactician. Right. Oh, you know, even if we've got the ultimate plan, we just don't have the numbers. Like, however clever, we're still going to take some hits. I really don't want to die. I put so much into this character. I'm 10th level now. It took me forever to get here. And anybody can die like that in combat. You know, there's variables. There's lots of variables. But all they have to do is get a, a couple of open-ended rolls, which is like 96 or higher in percentile, and it's David versus Goliath time, right? Right, yeah. It, it, Rollmaster allows for that to happen. You can't do that in D&D. You cannot do a David versus Goliath in D&D without modifying the rules. Second edition, Nat you Nat 20. Nat 20 is not going to take out... Uh, without modifying the rules, there's no way a Nat 20 is going to take out David versus Goliath. If you have David, who's, you know, let's say, first-level fighter, yeah. versus Goliath, who's a 20th-level fighter, no no single Nat 20 is going to take out Goliath, right? There's no way to yeah, take him out. Yeah, he's going to have to get multiple tattoos because he's not going to do enough damage. You can't damage. take him out in one hit. Yeah. Rollmaster makes it possible. Extremely difficult. Extremely lucky. Makes it possible to die in one blow. It makes the David versus Goliath scenario possibility for everyone, no matter your level. You can be 50th level wizard and Conan can still kill you at 10th level, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so this, it, this creates a situation, and a lot of people have to unlearn how they play D&D &D and other games, which they're used to be able to charge in and not have many consequences to their actions. I love games that have consequences. That's why I like aim and tour because it has consequences to your actions with shadow points etc doctor who has story points etc on your initiative so anything that has consequences to actions because that's a great teaching tool for anybody all ages um i think is wonderful and the master has brutal <laughs> lessons to be taught so now you're going to start role playing you're going to want to talk or diplomacy or sneak or something rather than fight and blow things up however that being said you have a wonderful arsenal of fighting and blowing things up that are extremely varied. You don't get into the, I roll 18, okay, I do 8 hit points. Okay, I rolled a 19, all right, I did 8 hit points. All right, I rolled a 20, all right, I do 8 hit points, right? And there's no description, descriptor to it. Rollmaster, every critical, has a detailed description of hundreds and hundreds of different crit results. Now, you are always welcome to make them up yourselves, as we do with d d yeah. But the purists in D&D &D hate that. Gygax hated that. He was very much against crit charts, and then he did Boot Hill. That's a different story. Um, so, but it takes a different type of GM to take Rollmaster and make it em emphasize R-O-L-E playing. So that's my personal preference. Now, that being said, when I was originally saying, I can totally play No Thank You Evil or a light system like that. I really struggle with Firefly because of lack of equipment. That was the biggest thing with, with the Firefly one, is no equipment. But if they would just added a few little details, 
without the rest of the system I could live with as an abstract, then I would have less of a pet peeve about the the one prior to it was very rules light, and I was perfectly okay with it. It worked. It was fun. It was no problem. The setting worked. It, it was beautifully written. And as long as we are all having fun, the players are having fun, and I'm having fun, I can play a totally light system. I mean, I can play Amber. I can play. I do LARP, right? We do improv LARP. Yeah. So, uh, so despite my preference for a heavy, crunchy system, I can have just as much fun because I don't have an ego about no. It has to be my way. Because again, I'm not. You know, even though we all have different control freak issues, as a game master, I, it's not about control for me. It's about that we all have a great time. Without the, without the sacrifice of down the road either that we can keep having at right. time, so we and we talked about that in some previous sessions. <clears throat> so yeah, so that's my preference, but I I'm not like well no if I don't get what I want I'm not going to have fun right. <laughs> it's not it's not that big like an issue. Go home. Yeah, exactly. Like it's not my way then it's the highway. I'm not like that at all. So I'm perfectly happy to play a light system as long as it works for everybody. We played kids with bikes. Yeah, totally light system. I had that on um, hold at um, Uncle's right. Okay, right. cool. Yeah, we, totally light system. We we played one session. That was what, what was uh, was that Michael who ran that? Yeah. Yeah, it was a blast. And we all and he because he was great. We we were all on. It was a good night for that game. Uh, I think Brad was there. You were there. I think Dan was there. I like the character creation. Yeah, but. It just was a good game. It wasn't the game system itself. It was just a well-done game overall. The GM did a good job, and we had fun. And ultimately, that's what mattered. And that was a memorable experience. We had a memorable game in that one quick session. Now, we were all experienced players there at that time. And that helped because our attitudes were willing to set aside our expectations and try this game and have fun. And it worked. We were, it just clicked nicely. It doesn't always work that way. Um, but, yeah, my preference is... Everybody has a good time. <laughs> That's my number one preference. And that was, remember, rule number one in here. Yeah. That everybody have fun, and then I just, you know. So, uh, almost out of time here. Uh, okay. It's not to say you should utterly ignore your own taste. You won't get far trying to use a rule set written for a style you can't stand. Again, we've just now discussed that. But a big disparity between your taste and the apparent desires of your group serves as an early indication that you'll have to work extra hard to keep this particular mix of people challenged and entertained. There are things you can do to compensate for this taste gap between yourself and your players, and they're easiest to do if you are, you're aware of the need in advance. And that's true of anything that we've talked about is mindfulness, awareness. That's why we have these discussions. It gets you now when you run your next game, some of these things are going to be going through the back of your mind it's going to kind of percolate up here and they're like, oh, I'm kind of noticing this and I'm kind of noticing that that you might not have considered before. And that's why these discussions are useful. I'm going to try to cram in this last portion here because the next one after is campaign design, which is a whole other discussion, which will be interesting, but we'll have to do that next time, uh, which will be next week for that topic because we've got mm -hmm. applied gaming Thursday and such. Although this Thursday, we're going to we are going to cover a little bit of discussion on... Um, sexuality and role-playing games during the talk show so uh, during the talk show yeah so from 4 to 5 p.m. before our 6 to 9 applied game and what, what applied game are we doing this Thursday uh, the ghost one oh we're gonna do the one page the one page and then we'll try to work Who's on running Twilight 2000 we're supposed to do Twilight 2000 yeah. after yes, that yes Twilight 2000 is supposed okay. to go after that okay Drake's um, gonna run that I speak about that topic I have something What's that, Daniel? Uh, I can speak about that topic in particular. I have some, I can have a few stories about it. Which topic? Uh, sexuality in roles and games. Well, if you want to join us for our talk show, if you're available, uh, that'll be from 4 to 5 p.m. this Thursday. So it'll be before our normal 6 to 9 session. Because we, we have, so this Thursday we have the RPG talk show. It's just one hour. And then we have our normal Thursday 6 to 9 p.m. session, which will be uh, applied gaming this Thursday. If you want to join us for the talk show, we would welcome you. I'd like to as well. Oh, cool. Yeah, if you're available. I, might, I have a lot of stories to share. Uh, it's actually a bit of an origin story for me. <laughs> cool. Well, we'll have to, we'll have to do that uh, either uh, at the talk show or the, that evening. We'd be happy to hear. We've got we to hurry and cover these things before... I run out of time here, though. 
So so hang on to that because I'd love to hear it, and I, I think everybody else here would love that too. So we've got one book here, Rutledge's Advantage, Advances in Game Studies, Sexuality and Role-Playing Games by Ashley M.L. Brown. And then, John, you're bringing... Um, the Book of Erotic Fantasy. Book of Erotic Fantasy, which was specifically adapted to D&D 3rd Edition, 3.5, right? Yes. Uh, for, to bring sex into your games and such. So we're going to discuss that a little bit in our talk show at uh, 4 to f- uh, 5 p.m. this Thursday Pacific time. All right, let me hurry and fly through this. We're going to run a little bit over on time here, but uh, consider our technical issues. I hope folks will understand. Homebrew rules. Okay, this is homebrew stuff. Many game masters enjoy tinkering with rules, I agree with that, or find that existing rule sets don't cater exactly to their tastes. Instead of using a published system, you may want to use rules of your own creation. Rules tinkerers among you may want to heavily modify an existing rule set or create something out of whole cloth. The choice to use your own rules set imposes an additional burden on you and on your group. That is true. During play, you'll be thinking not only of keeping the other players entertained within the current adventure, but about your rules and whether they do what you want. Players will feel free not to only question your rules interpretations, but to argue that the rules themselves need to be altered. That can be a real problem with home rules, and we, especially if a rules lawyer, you can really trigger their anxiety levels. And so you really have to, we've talked about it before, there's a process to handle a rules lawyer, and especially if you're going to modify the rules, you need to do it in an consi- internally consistent and predictable way. If you don't do that, you are going to get arguments and it will screech the game to a halt. Uh, but to argue that the rules themselves need to be altered. Sometimes they'll be right, and their suggestions will improve your rule set. So always be willing to listen to them when you do that and see what happens. Uh, however, you'll be taking time away from the game itself every time you stop to discuss the rules. Certain players will enjoy this process as much as, if not more than, actual play. Before you embark on this process, you need to make sure that you have this kind of these kinds of players. Players who also GM may take great interest in game design. Tacticians may enjoy looking for holes in your crunchy bit descriptions, though they'll shake their heads ruefully when you fix them. On the other hand, storytellers may be bored by the process. Butt kickers might figure that the time spent on rules issues might be better devoted to carnage and mayhem. The eyes of casual gamers will certainly glaze over. Specialists, once they've made sure that their signature powers work properly, may also join the ranks of the wearied. Method actors may resent a process that keeps their abilities in a state of flux as you refine and alter your roster of crunchy bits. Occasionally remind yourself that the playtesting process is of greater interest to you than it is to your players. It's easy to get caught up in the fun of creation and forget the gigantic favor your players are doing for you by agreeing to be your guinea pigs. Every so often, you should stop and ask yourself the following question. Rule number seven. Do my rules exist to make my game better? Or does my game exist merely to make my rules better? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah, and that... And that uh, what's that? I have a kick experience of creating rules and dealing with rules discussions in my session. Granted that there are usually with very few players, like two maximum. Yep. Yep, and I do too. I've I've gone through many, either creating my own rules or heavily modifying. If you want, you can check out earpg.com, and you'll see where I modified uh, D&D 3.5 heavily to better fit Middle Earth. And really, I didn't modify the main mechanics. What I modified was the classes and the race, well, the races. I modified the races and the magic most heavily, um, and then to some degree the classes. But my biggest modifications were the races and the magic for ARPG. And that worked, right? We were talking about that incrementally where I moved them from D&D to D&D Middle Earth to Merp to Rollmaster. It was a helpful process. Um, but a lot of people really liked the, those modifications because they preferred, they didn't want to learn a whole new system, but they were also Middle Earth fans. They didn't want to have to learn Merp or Rollmaster or Decipher or Tor or AIM or whatever. But that's what AIM did right. AIM did basically what I did. Yeah. took the existing D&D and then layered on top the key Middle Earth parts. And that makes it accessible. We talked about accessibility earlier. Uh, to people, who, they don't have to learn a whole new system. They just have to learn an additional layer. And AIM does add a lot of complexity, right? D&D already has complexity. AIM adds a lot of complexity. 
And guess what? It raises people up. Mm-hmm. We've seen that time and time again. It is If you run a D&D three, uh, 5 game at a community center with at-risk youth, you're going to get very different game and behavior than if you run AIM with the exact same people. We've seen it yeah. repeatedly. These kids are going to come in for D&D just to kill things and slaughter things and potentially reinforce negative behaviors. They play AIM, their behavior gets modified, and they still have a wonderful time. And... They look harder. They take a deeper look at themselves, too, because the game kind of forces them to. So, again, I talk about that using it's okay to raise people up. It's better to raise people up than to dumb down. Um, so, But I, I think that's a great thing because, yeah, you want to really look at, you know, are the rules existing to make my game better or does my game exist merely to make my rules better? Now, he's saying that in the context of homebrew, but I'm saying that in the context of all rules because I always talk about story trumps rules. And, and, and now, do you prefer Daniel or Dan? I'm sorry? Do you prefer Daniel or Dan? Um, I'm sorry, I lost you there. I'm fine either way. Okay. No preference, actually. Okay, because <laughs> some people have a preference, so I just wanted to know. But, you know, Dan, you and I have talked about, you said also that you prefer RLE play just as I do. And that, and you said the the, mad, the buzzwords. If John had been here when you, you and I were talking the other day, and you were saying, you know, basically the equivalent of story trumps rules, you would have seen me going, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like yes, join our team. We totally agree with you. <laughs> um, you don't want to ignore the rules, but you want to you want to not let them ruin a good story. So. Uh huh. I that that the rules are an ongoing and renewable social contract between the GM and the players, between the group, basically. Yes. And in order to discuss the rules, you have to see, okay, we have this rule. The intention behind it is to, uh, and to prevent this thing from happening or to make this thing happen. What do you think? And people argue back and forth about the implications of that. I could offer specific examples. But I'm not sure if we should get into this. Yeah, we're out of, tonight we're out of time. But we will bring these, this topic will come up many times. And so here's the thing. Here's the difference between a role-playing game and either freeform drama or children's Let's Pretend. The structured rules. It reduces arguing. Because when you have kids playing Let's Pretend, we're going to play soldiers or cops and robbers or whatever. Bang. Bang. No, I had an invisible shield that, that saved me from that bullet. Magic bullets that go through invisible shields. Yes, but I had a shield for that, for the magic bullets to also deflect those away, too. And I was able to twist over out of the way just in time. That's when my ninja cat came out from behind you. <laughs> yes, but he would have bumped against the shield and it would have electrocuted him. Right? So you, you just sit there arguing. And, you know, so it devolves if you don't have, as you say, a social contract that everybody agrees to play by the same rules. So you do have to honor that contract. Which, by the way, is a wonderful segue to make sure... You tune into our Sunday show, twitch.tv forward slash RPG Research, Heroes of the Mist. One of the players, his character, the, his main interest is contract negotiations and enforcement. So you will hear him every episode talking about contracts. It's very funny. He's a half-elf, half-elf fighter thief, and he's a contract enforcer, and he loves to write and discuss contracts. It is so funny. Uh, it's Joe. Who oh, right, right, right. Uh, so Joe is a professional improv comic out of Seattle Jet City. He remotes in uh, every Sunday. He's also the brother of my fiance uh, girlfriend Katie. Um, full dis- disclosure, um, and they're both the two most rebellious folks in the whole group. We found out during the inter- interrogations. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever go back? Because you weren't here for the whole interrogations, right? You left as well, or were you here? For no, that? I was here for the interrogations. Okay, you, you're, you're the only one who saw that then. Yeah. So I was Helga. Yes, you're Helga. That's right. That's right. So you got to see right. the rebellion that both no. Joe and Katie had. Yeah, Katie ultimately Joe did it through his character. Everybody else was pretty compliant. You know, it was really funny to see the the siblings there do that. Anyway, I ramble, but yeah. Uh, so you're talking about social contracts. Excellent. Um, really glad we got to uh, get you got to meet some of the other uh, staff here, Dan. Um, so glad you are aboard. Uh, We'll continue your onboarding and get you access to those videos and essays so we can get you trained up. Yeah, if you can join us for the talk show, uh, let me know. That'll be uh, 4 to 5 p.m. this Thursday. And then, of course, our game session will be 6 to 9 p.m. this Thursday. 
all Pacific time, of course. And, uh, yeah, we'll be doing a, uh, a one sheet role playing game. Um, what was it called again? Do you remember? No. Uh, uh dead again? No, 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 no. Oh. it was, um, something about like revenge or. Well, basically you've yeah. died and you've come back to get revenge or whatever, but yeah. cause it's Halloween coming around the corner. So, so it's a one shot, one sheet role playing game. Everything's on one page and we're just going to play that. And usually those games don't take very long. And then uh, after that, we're going to make characters for Twilight 2000 because talking about crunchy systems or whatever. Yeah. And Twilight 2000 is a different game. It has a very different feel than a lot of other games I've played. There's no magic and there's no sci-fi. It's a realistic, and, and in quotes realistic, because it's not ultimately realistic, but it tries to be... I believe it was realistic. Yeah, <laughs> but, it, it, but it, it tries to be a realistically difficult military survival game in, and it was written in the 1980s during the height of the Cold War, so it assumes that nuclear missiles did finally fly between the USSR and, 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 the, and the U.S. and such, and that now you're trying to survive it. It's not Gamma World. There's no mutants. It's gritty. It's challenging. Yeah. And it's a lot of fun. It was my third favorite game when I was running all those games in the late 80s and 90s, and I had all those groups. People loved MERP, AD&D, uh, slash Call of Cthulhu. They were kind of tied. And uh, Twilight 2000. They, like Everybody just loved it. Mm. So we're going to be, we're going to, we're just going to be able to make, we'll, we'll probably only get through the character creation process, depending. We might get the opening scene started, and then we'll continue that that Monday, the actual adventure part of it. And a lot of it is just kind of a lot of running away, <laughs> because combat is deadly. You know, if you start shooting at each other, you do not, if, if you get a toe-to-toe -to -toe shooting match, that's bad. Because you get injured very quickly. Even with body armor and everything, it takes you out quickly. So you want to, at all costs, try to avoid combat if you can. Sometimes you have no choice. Sometimes you've got to go take the, the weapons depot guards out because you're out of supplies. You have to still your own fuel because you're running out of fuel. Um, and there's lots and lots of role play. Yes, it's a military survival game, but it's also a ton of role play. The modules that it comes with are heavy on politics and political intrigue and working with gangsters and mafias and all of this to try to negotiate stuff. And it's just a game of survival. It is a survival game. Um, and it's, it's, and be, it, it's a lot of fun. And, and it has a different, it just feels different to me than any other game I've played. There, there's others that touch on it. But it's also concepts of coolness under fire, which you don't usually see, which you'll mm -hmm. hear me use all that time. In other words, when combat starts or a bomb goes off or something, some people re react well and react in the moment and function well and their training kicks in. Other people, you know, duck and cover and go into the fetal position and freak out. Other people just go berserk, right? People lose it. You don't know until you're under that kind of stress how you'll behave. Yeah. Fight, flight, yeah. Wow. Fight, flight, or freeze. Yes. Um, and I have been in real life in in very violent, dangerous situations, in, including shootouts and such. And I'm a person who reacts. I I I react. I my training comes in and I've done well. Um, but I've watched people freeze all the time, hesitate, look around, not know what to do, look at others what to do, and it's too late by the time you do that. Um, so this concept of coolness under fire being built into the game is a wonderful concept. Uh, it has hit locations for each different parts of your body. Each arm, each leg, chest, abdomen, and head are all different hit points that you track separately. Um, again, this whole concept of you have to make your own fuel You've got to scavenge for food. You've got to scavenge for spare parts. Um, the rules system's actually very relatively light rule system. The rule book for the player's book is only like 20, 30 pages, and the GM's guide is only like 20, 30 pages. It's tiny. And most of those rule books are actually just a history of the setting. There's only half those pages are actually rules. Okay. And yet it has a great level of detail, even though it's not that complex on the rules. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll get into that Thursday, um, and I can get you, I can send you PDFs of the character generation, character sheet and stuff, so you'll be able to follow along as we go through the process. Uh, thank you very much. You bet. It's We're... quite eye-opening experience. I've never seen that these, uh, I always see this as a very complex game, and I always think that it's Yes. With my experience. 
Yeah, and that and that's an important thing that if you do add complexity, you don't want to slow the game down too much. That's always a challenge. Because that is the one nice thing about a rules light system is usually the gameplay is faster. That one I'll agree with. Lighter rules usually means faster gameplay. Doesn't mean intense gameplay though. Right. Sometimes the heavier rules will speed up the intensity of the game. But lighter rules, you don't take as long to factor things out, that's faster. Roll master's a little slower because you have to roll twice if there's a critical. You roll first, you know, the 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 attacker rolls and the defender either rolls or just adds some math to it. I then cross-reference in a chart to see if it hit or not. In that chart, it tells me if it hit or not and the severity of the hit. If it's a critical hit, I then have to open my crit book, which is a separate section, and look at the crits specific to that weapon and that level of severity of crit. And then roll percentile for that chart. So I have to roll twice. Anytime you have to do two rolls and make two chart lookups, it's going to be slower. Now, the good thing is... Um, you can get pretty fast at it. So you'll see me, if I do Rollmaster, I get all my stools and everything out, and I have all the books out. Like, you tell me what your weapons are, and whoever's in combat at the time, I put the pages out in advance to have them in front of me so I can go pretty quickly. But it is inherently a little bit slower to resolve action. But that's not to say that the action isn't more intense. Because they're always like, what's going to happen? Am I going to lose an ear? Am I going to lose an eye? It, it's because it's so gritty. Um, but yeah, you, it, it really is more than complexity. There is the speed of the game, the speed of rules resolution, the intensity of the experience. Yeah, those are all, there's so many variables. It's very fun. I'm so glad you found it eye-opening. And we have just barely scratched the surface for you, Dan, just barely. So very excited to have you on board. And thank you, those who've been tuning in and out. <laughs> right. And uh, so we're going to call it, we're, we're a little, little over here. We're going to call it a night. So uh, remember, we'll be back, uh, RPG Talk Show, RPGTalkShow.com. Uh, it'll be this Thursday. It's our new time from 4 to 5 p.m. Pacific time. And then we will be doing the Applied Gaming this Thursday, 6 to 9 p.m. So join us right here on twitch.tv forward slash RPG Research. And please donate to RPG Research. Go to RPGResearch.com and click on Donate. Wherever you may be, be well. Happy gaming and namarie. And dream well. Good night. And Dan, you goodbye. have any? Okay, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> and bye. <laughs> so yeah, we each do.